is a landmark piece. Hi, everyone. Hi, welcome, and thanks for joining us for today's discussion on the Artificial Intelligence Act, which is a landmark piece of legislation that the European Commission published a year ago. It seeks to regulate artificial intelligence in the EU using a risk-based framework. Certain uses of AI are to be banned outright, such as social credit scoring or mass surveillance. Other uses, such as in public services, public infrastructure, or access to essential services like finance or education or recruitment, are classed as high risk and subject to a range of detailed compliance and technical requirements. The AI Act is currently under negotiation in various EU parliamentary committees, as well as the Council of Ministers. And Parliament and Member States have begun to submit a, a wide range of proposals to amend the Act. And today we're going to spend some time unpacking the state of play, what might change, and what happens next. I'm really pleased to discuss this topic today with a fantastic panel. With us are Sylvia Giepman Stepien, who is the Head of Economic Policy, Competition and Emerging Tech at Google's EU Government Affairs and Public Policy team. She leads Google's public policy strategy and advocacy on artificial intelligence and sustainability in Brussels. We also have with us Julia Fenard, the European Public Affairs and Communications Director at France Digital, one of Europe's largest startup organizations representing over 1,800 member companies. We're also pleased to have with us today Mikael Refai, the Digital and Telecommunications Advisor at the French Permanent Representation to the European Union. He's just disappeared, uh, but he's uh, had some connection issues, so I'm, I'm positive he'll be back before long. Uh, Mikael is in charge of legislative initiatives related to artificial intelligence, cloud, and the data economy. And a very warm welcome also to Jordanka Ivanova, who is legal and policy officer in the European Commission at the unit responsible for AI policy. She's a member of the legal team who has drafted the AI Act. And thank you all very much for being here today. The format of today's event is a moderated Q&A. So I will begin by posing questions to various panelists before moving on to audience questions afterwards. Please uh, do use the Slido link uh, below to submit your questions. And I'm going to try to get through as many of them as possible. So without further ado, let's begin. Um, Mikael, I wanted to start with you. Can you uh, hear me OK? Mikael is uh, in a frozen state, um, so why don't I move on to um, Julia. Um, Julia, I wanted to uh, um, get a sense of what the sentiment is inside the French tech startup sector around the AI Act. France obviously being a digital powerhouse in the European Union, so uh, the, the views inside France are going to be indicative of, of, uh, of wider perspectives held by members of the startup ecosystem in Europe. So could you talk to us a little bit about some of the positive perspectives that you hear and also some of the concerns uh, that you are encountering? Thank you so much, Benjamin. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about AI startups. Um, to introduce myself quickly, um, I work for France Digital. France Digital is the largest startup association in Europe. We represent more than 1,800 startups and more than 100 VCs venture capitalists. Um, and the reason why I'm here today so is to, is to speak of the potential impact of the AI Act on startups. But what are we talking about exactly when we are talking about the AI startup community or ecosystem? Uh, how important are these companies uh, in the economy? So, so maybe to help us grasp a little better the impact, uh, I would like to give you a few figures on the French AI startup. Um, last year, in November, we realized a mapping of AI startups in France, and we count more than 500 AI startups, um, which is an 11% increase in comparison to the previous years. That's huge. The trend is pretty amazing, and we hope uh, it will stay this way. These companies are young. 73% of them are less than six years old. 
Um, the good news and the excellent news is that our French and you know European star AI startups are able to attract investors. They attract money. Uh, we count more than two billion investment in AI startups in 2021 only, and this is uh, twice as much as the previous year. So again, the trend is uh, is really great. And then these companies also they create jobs. In AI startups only, we count more than 15,000 uh, jobs. And the great news is that they are planning also to create more than 10,000 this year only um, in 2022. So um, the idea is that the AI startup ecosystem is flourishing. Uh, therefore, we should look at the potential impact, of course, of the um, of the AI Act. So what we did at France Digital to, to ask them, what do you think about the text? Is that we gathered them in a group with more than 100 startups and we analyzed uh, the AI Act. So what we conclude is that, you know, mainly these companies, they welcome the ambition of the European Commission to regulate um, high risk AI, you know, that might go against European values on, on facial recognitions, etc. Et but the idea is that the new regulatory bur burden should not discourage AI founders or investors um, from engaging in Europe. So we must ensure that a, a VC, for example, an investor will choose a European startup to invest his money on rather than a similar startup elsewhere in the world. And the competition is tough. Um, so, you know, to sum up, there are some things that we believe could be improved in the text. The things the startups pointed out the most are um, th that we could improve the clarity of the scope of the AI Act. Uh, we could clarify also the technical feasibility of certain obligations on data sets, for example. Uh, things were pretty unclear in the first version. It got better after. Uh, regulatory sandbox. I could um, explain a bit more on that, but that's an amazing opportunity. Compatibility with GDPR. I think you, all of us around the table might have heard about this issue in the text, but uh, honestly, sometimes uh, we don't really know which text should we respect, the AI Act or the GDPR, how these two things will work out together. And lastly, the um, responsibility and liability part. You know, as you know, many startups, they use small pieces of artificial intelligence from bigger companies, from Microsoft or Google, and then they uh, design these technologies to better fit their product and services. So at the end, who's responsible? Um, so that's the five main questions that our community raised. Fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for that, Julia. And Jordanka, you are back, bang on time. Um, I have taken note of uh, some of the issues that, uh, that came up. Um, that Julia raised. Uh, the first question was around what the French startup ecosystem has to say about the AI Act. Uh, and we're going to try and unpack as many of those as, as we can. But I wanted to, to start uh, by talking about a, a specific issue that Julia raised, which is around um, clarifying the scope of the AI Act. And the way I see it, that's linked to an ongoing debate around the definition of AI in the Act, as well as other uh, as other parts, um, you know, with regards to high risk classifications, but focusing on, on, on how to define AI for the purposes of this law. Um, how, how did the commission approach this issue when uh, the law was drafted? Was the intention to cast a wide definitional net in order to capture, uh, we've, we've lost, we've lost your Danka. Uh, let's hope that no, the, no, I'm um, here. I'm here. Sorry, I'm here. Okay. I'm... No problem. That's great. I'm, I'm glad we haven't lost you. Uh, so yes, the, was the intention to 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 have a wide definition in order to capture as much software as possible, or was the intention uh, to focus on quote unquote genuine AI products? Um, and so, how what 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 do you have to say about questions around scope of the law and and uh, startups wanting more clarity? <clears throat> 
Uh, no, that's uh, that's a very important question indeed because uh, the AI definition still remains one of the the most debated uh, issue in the negotiation process. Um, and uh, here we have seen different opinions ranging from um, covering any automated decision-making systems uh, similar to GDPR to having a much more narrow focus, focusing only on machine learning. I can maybe explain a bit of the rationale of uh, the commission proposal where we try to find the middle ground uh, because we have indeed considered different options. And I think our objective was um, indeed to capture and make this definition uh, broad enough to cover, uh, but also future proof to cover AI systems um, that are already displaying certain functional characteristics and that are um, that are prone to show certain biases, um, unpredictability, um, or also um, um, autonomy um, that can be um, quite dangerous, lead to certain risks. So that's why we try to focus and relying very much on the OECD definition um, to show these characteristics where systems can display um, that behavior, um, generate certain outcomes that can affect uh, uh, people and the environment more broadly, but also provide certain um, list of techniques that could be used. And here we have not focused only on machine learning, but following also the existing OECD work and scientific community uh, consensus a bit, we've seen that there are also other approaches um, like reasoning um, um, and also statistical um, approaches, modeling that could be also used to, to build those models with uh, those capabilities. Um, and I think this was a bit of a balanced approach um, uh, and solution uh, we have found because otherwise we would really risk also to, on one hand, distort the market because we could just regulate machine learning. Everyone would be afraid uh, to use it, but then you could very well uh, use uh, similar techniques and have same systems that are uh, equally risky also for, for people um, um, and also even for companies when they are uh, using them. Um, so this was the main considerations. And I think uh, the objective was also to to leave it future proof enough because we, what we are seeing now as AI is um, we are already seeing a lot of challenges and techniques that are emerging and we, we want to keep it um, indeed uh, as future proof as possible. Great, um, thank you very much for that. That's that's very um, very helpful and insightful. And so I basically take it that uh, the definition is supposed to reflect a combination of uh, capabilities driven approach, looking just at what a system can do, as well as technical elements. And I guess that's the uh, the debate now is uh, how to operationalize that and whether there are unintended um, consequences. Um, Jordanka, if if I may. Uh, just to pick up on another issue that uh, Julia raised, which I think you're actually very well placed to comment on, given that you uh, have uh, legal expertise, uh, and it's something that also uh, comes up often in in, um, in my work. Uh, what uh, do you have to say about concerns around the compatibility of the AI Act with uh, GDPR obligations? I'm sure that the Commission uh, you know, has spent a lot of time thinking about uh, uh, these overlaps and ensuring that, um, you know, that, that there's some, some, some sort of alignment or, or interoperability is possible. Um, but given that some of the requirements of the AI Act, particularly around uh, reducing bias and discrimination, uh, require uh, data collection that in a non-AI GDPR-only world would be a bit more problematic, I just wondered what you can say uh, about uh, how the AI Act is going to sit alongside GDPR in future and, and uh, what the Commission has, has thought about that as it drafted the law. Yeah, that's uh, also a very important point because um, when we proposed um, the requirements and the obligations, um, obviously we were looking actually to fill some gaps if they are. And that was on one hand also to support uh, providers and users in their compliance with uh, existing obligations, because we have seen actually that uh, there are a lot of problems um, for data contro controllers as users who get those models and systems from the market, but um, they are not uh, sufficiently um, uh, interpretable for them. Uh, they don't have uh, the right documentation that could be then used 
useful actually for their activities. Um, it is always not certain the level of uh, reliability. So we really aim to cover that gap and capture and the main regulatory burden on the manufacturers of those systems who are actually often uh, not subjected to GDPR because the GDPR by design principle applies only to data controllers. Um, and in this way, actually to facilitate compliance for users who can be SMEs, um, employers, public authorities, then really to fulfill uh, their obligations, um, including to enable human oversight because they have to understand how these systems behave what are what are its limitations um, and capabilities to appropriately use it and then obviously also to to not to be uh, responsible uh, in a way if uh, it turns out that uh, it is designed in such a biased way that the user can do nothing um, so it would be actually the one afterwards uh, liable for this um, so in this sense um, we've really tried to to fill that gap um, and to ensure this complement Parity of the works. Um, that's why we have also not gone beyond that. Actually, this, um, these um, requirements for the system as such, uh, going beyond and also providing remedies um, to affected people, because actually we thought that all those um, people already ha have their rights um, actually protected and they should have their data subjects rights. They should have the opportunity if they wish uh, to go to court, not to be discriminated. And that was the, the purpose to, to make those actually remedies effective because when a, a, a data protection authority wants to see and inspect the system, it is transparent enough. It has the, uh, the appropriate documentation um, so, um, uh, in this sense, um, uh, we, we really aim to enable um, the, the exercise of those remedies. Cool. Thank, thanks for that. Um, so, uh, clearly also another area uh, where, where people are, are thinking a lot about the ramifications and whether there are ways to, to streamline some of the provisions. Uh, and I guess, uh, for the sake of argument, it is interesting to point out that, uh, you know, parts of GDPR um, uh, revolve precisely around concerns around uh, automated processing and ensuring people have rights in those contexts. Um, and so then uh, it stands to reason uh, that uh, the, the AI Act um, may, may in part um, overlap with some of those obligations and, and, and as such it's certainly worth uh, probing that a bit. Uh, so clearly more, more work for the policy uh, nerds among us to figure all of that out. Um, I, I want to move on to uh, ask uh, uh, you a question, Sylvia, um, which is uh, uh, something that also came up in, in, in Julia's first uh, answer um, relating uh, to the responsibilities and also liability uh, provisions um, under the AI Act. Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on the balance of responsibilities of different actors in the AI value chain? Um, and if you could actually also... Um, contextualize that with regards to general purpose AI, which um, hopefully we'll get a chance to ask Mikael in a bit, uh, is one of the developments that seems to have uh, occurred in the last um, in the last few months under the French presidency. But uh, for, for, for now, um, Sylvia, interested to hear your thoughts on on, on this. Yes, Hartu. Hi, everyone. Um, and your Danka kind of a bit started that discussion, um, explaining that AI app has been kind of um, written with the perspective of, of product safety uh, framework. Um, however, from, from our perspective, uh, that kind of leads to sometimes to the situations that the complexities of the value chain that are kind of much um, uh, concise, the kind of the product, um, uh, kind of hardware product uh, situations are, are very much different in the kind of uh, real world AI applications because those oftentimes can contain multiple models they are developed by different kind of research and engineering teams are utilizing multiple data sets from multiple sources, uh, co-developed by different organizations and then kind of can be deployed by, by uh, final users in multiple um, use cases. So that sort of value chain is much more complex than in kind of uh, product safety 
context. Um, and what does, does it mean for companies like Google? Um, so looking at the kind of at the risk-based approach of the commission, which I think it's a really important cornerstone and something that we very much support. Um, I think in a business to consumer context, when Google, for instance, develops and deploys its own products directly to consumers, those responsibilities are kind of clear for us. If we would fall into the category of a, of a high risk, we, of course, as a kind of um, developer or provider and, and users, we would be kind of fully and squarely uh, in charge of complying with the with the AI Act. However, it becomes a bit more challenging for, for companies like Google or any kind of company that is developing uh, those off-the-shelf solution, general purpose AI open source, um, uh, in mind with those kind of very complex value chain, uh, if all the kind of responsibilities uh, fall on the provider. Uh, in particular, if those systems, those general purpose systems or open source systems um, are not specifically intended for high risk AI systems, they don't have, in fact, even uh, intended purpose or risk profile per se. Uh, but of course, um, they can be used uh, by different organizations in a manner that could be high risk uh, and then, of course, would have to kind of fall into uh, compliance with the AI Act. So if I can take an example, uh, for instance, image recognition, IPI, can be used for different use cases, a plant detection. You know, uh, we have a lot of those gardening apps that help us to detect what sort of plants we have in our home. But image detection and recognition can be used also for cancer detection, so healthcare um, or military purposes. So very different use cases of a kind of those general purpose. Uh, systems uh, that as a provider, um, uh, Google and other kind of co uh, companies, and those are not only kind of uh, American companies, uh, can be uh, indeed very much be dependent on the use case uh, and that defines very much the purpose and, and the risk scenario. So what we have been kind of calling in that context uh, um, is to provide for a, a bit more uh, balanced responsibilities uh, um, in the value chain and, and to make sure that uh, when a user uh, kind of modifies the systems, the general purpose system in a high risk application, um, that they uh, effectively can assume uh, those responsibilities and, and not the providers of those off the shelf solutions. Because uh, of course we want to kind of make sure that there are enough protections and that the providers um, kind of provide all in, uh, important information as your Demka was explaining, you know, some of the companies might be using different uh, solutions on, on the market, but at the same time, if you put those um, providers of general purpose AI systems, uh, require them to have uh, to fulfill all those obligations for systems that can be actually no high risk, you actually the, the don't create incentives for them um, uh, for uh, putting those systems on the market for non high risk applications. Uh, so that's from the kind of the market perspective. And then if you look at actually the kind of the consumer um, value, because of course we have to look at uh, different actors in the value chain, but effectively we want to protect uh, European users from you know, um, interacting with, uh, um, uh, with systems that would you know, be uh, dangerous from the product safety or from fundamental rights. Um, you might uh, encounter a situation that a provider of the system might be not even aware um, that somebody is using uh, those systems uh, um, in, in high risk scenarios, in, in particular, if you look at open source systems, where actually effectively, in case of Google, oftentimes we are not even aware who is building on the top of those systems. So I think from that perspective, this is an important clarification and, and something that we wanted to, to bring to the discussion. But of course, uh, probably, you know, um, a, a compromise and a balance uh, lay somewhere in there. And from our perspective, this is not to say that as a provider, we don't see um, uh, obligations. Uh, the call would be to also kind of make sure that those who are best placed, that use those systems in high risk scenarios that are actually able to um, input data um, into those systems that can actually effectively implement human oversights that, they, that, that uh, those responsibilities are kind of balanced across the value chain. Thank you, Sylvia. Very interesting and obviously a live debate uh, and also an example of how uh, the policy ambition um, has to be has to be made consistent with the sort of uh, technical complexities um, of of uh, of the world we live in, including things like open source. Um, and uh, and and that's precisely why we're having dialogues such as such as the one today. Um, I, I I did want to also um, ask uh, uh, Julia. 
to comment on uh, issues that were raised uh, concerning um, the, the, the um, assignment of responsibilities in the value chain and what, uh, what uh, your members uh, in your organizations um, specifically raised uh, about this. Um, thank you. So I think the main point for us is, uh, is having clarity. It's, it's just really understanding uh, when they are liable, when they are not, in which cases um, they should plan for conformity or not. So, so, so I mean, for us, when they read the text, it's really the main point is understanding um, what are their obligations, if they are, of course, in the high risk AI scope. Um, so, so it's even hard for them to assess, you know, the cost of compliance uh, with the current version of the text because um, things are not specified, it's not defined clearly yet. So um, honestly, the, the main thing that we ask at this stage, uh, it's really clarity, if I want to make things really short. Very interesting. Um, Mikael, uh, are you able to hear us? Give us a thumbs up if you can. Excellent, I, think, I, I take that as a yes. Um, so I, I want to, I want to um, come to you while we have you, if we have you. Um, and uh, in case that you disappear, I wonder if uh, your Duncan might be able to, to take the question. It's a little bit unfair, uh, but um, I think that you've probably followed the, the brief um, closely enough to give a sort of high level answer. I, I just want to give the audience an overview of how the AI Act has evolved during the French presidency. Um, what the sort of key developments and revisions are uh, that are shaping the current direction of the draft. Bearing in mind, obviously, that this is very much, um, you know, ongoing and, and nothing is set in stone. Um, and also bearing in mind, I think Mikael is no longer with us. Uh, so, Jordanka, if you if you if you could um, just take a stab at that, uh, I'm sure the audience would would appreciate it and also uh, take into account that the commission's work formally was was done last year. So it's not technically your job, but you probably have been following it anyway. Uh, yes, okay. Um, I'll try to, to cover for Mikael indeed while well, he's not here, but um, from what has been discussed over these past six months, um, actually the French presidency has already completed a first full compromise proposal on our articles. I think some of the issues that were already discussed, um, like uh, the, the value chain responsibility, how you shift uh, burden for compliance, who is just a user um, relying on already certified system, but nevertheless modifies the purpose for another than the one intended by the initial provider. Um, or where if it takes just a general purpose AI system and decides to use it for a, um, another high risk scenario, then it becomes provider. So I think there have been important developments also in this article 28. Um, that has been uh, substantially revised uh, by the French presidency. Then the topic of general purpose AI has been also discussed. Um, I think um, it was very interesting um, and good to hear from Sylvia that um, um, there is this common understanding that indeed some of these systems um, could, um, there could be risks that already arise um, at the level of design development, but then certainly um, there are other changes along the value chain that can be integrated by other users. So the French presidency has tried also to reflect on this. Um, certainly the idea is actually to facilitate again and support the, the, the user of those systems that might become a provider if it changes uh, the system. So um, it places under its own name or for the purpose of its own benefit. Um, so um, there have been uh, discussions um, and I think there is a growing understanding uh, 
there should be a bit more complex um, or, and balanced, uh, let's say, distribution of the responsibilities. Uh, now the French presidency has put forward uh, some proposals. They are still discussed um, uh, and um, also for other issues, like, for example, um, on the user's um, obligations, certain more clarity uh, has been given. Um, there, I just want to reassure Julia that indeed the objective is in the end, that especially if SMEs and uh, small companies or any public authorities is taking a system that is already intended by the provider to, to do a certain task. It's clearly fully um, uh, able to rely on it. Uh, of course, if we decide beyond uh, what the provider has set as uh, intended purpose for which the system has been checked, or if it decides to modify somehow the system, then Obviously, it, it would become uh, uh, also responsible for that modification, but the objective is that for the companies using the system, it can certainly rely on it. Um, and then there is also a bit of discussion how actually uh, providers could cooperate of those general purpose AI systems could cooperate with future users um, so that support them in any case um, uh, because obviously if it's only um, Google or uh, Facebook who have trained a very big uh, general purpose AI system it's only them who knows the information with what kind of data what kind of uh, uh, expectations there are for the systems um, uh, to behave um, how it has been developed designed um, so, um, taking into account also the need for confidentiality, there is a bit of discussion also how exactly to ensure that cooperation um, along the value chain. Um, and then um, the French presidency has done a very significant work on further clarifying and maybe simplifying um, some provisions. Um, I think especially for the requirements, uh, some that have been um, perceived um, as too strict and not giving sufficient flexibility, although uh, that has not been our policy intention because we've always tried to say this is taking into account the risks, the intended purpose, the state of the art. But there have been now a bit more clarity also in the text along um, those lines. Um, and there has been also a lot of work from the French presidency on the chapter of innovation where they have also tried a bit to relax uh, the regime for um, testing in real world conditions already before those systems are officially certified. So actually you support the process of conformity assessment where you can get actual results that show you how actually the systems behave in real conditions um, and also um, a lot of measures um, to, um, to beef up the, send, the regulatory sandboxes to support more the SMEs uh, with some more exceptions um, that have been added, for example, for micro enterprises uh, not to uh, be obliged to have quality management system. Um, quite some work also in the area of standards. We've lost your Danka uh, at a, a very interesting point, actually. I believe she's about to go into standards. Ah, your Danka, are you back? Uh, yes, yes, I'm sorry that this, the connection was a bit lost. But um, I think, yes, overall, these were the main issues that were uh, um, discussed. Of course, there are many others. Um, um, but um, I think those were mentioned today. So um, I hope that's uh, sufficient for uh, the discussion. That's more than sufficient, uh, and unfortunately, by giving such a, um, a standout, excellent answer, um, you have made yourself a viable candidate for uh, further questions that I was going to direct at uh, at Mikael. Um, so that's the the punishment of success. And I'm aware, your Danka, also that you have to leave slightly earlier. So please um, do do uh, give us a heads up if we're running out of time, as far as you're concerned, because I have uh, one or two more things that I did want to ask you, but. Um, uh, uh, Julia, this is actually also a question that came up um, in the audience, um, uh, uh, and it's it's something that uh, your Danka just briefly touched upon, and maybe she also wants to comment uh, subsequently. But it's the issue of sandboxes. Um, now, sandboxes are a tried and tested tool for regulators to try um, and sort of encourage experimentation and innovation for new technologies, new players. 
um, in an environment where they are closely monitored by the regulator, uh, but not necessarily subject um, to all uh, legal and compliance uh, rules for, for a given industry. Um, and I, I, I know that uh, there, there have been some uh, concerns raised in, in, in that particular aspect of the law. So, um, uh, Julia, I just wanted to give you a chance to also relay what your members um, have, have told you about this, and then maybe your, your Danker can, can, can comment on, on this issue. Uh, so, really important point, of course, the regulatory sandbox for, for startups. We, we haven't missed that part of the text. Uh, obviously, when we talk about all the administrative burden, uh, technical burden that the text might cause on AI risk startups, we really appreciated that the Commission came up with a solution to that. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it's the first time in history of European legislation that we have a regulatory sandbox in, um, in a text, which is uh, great news and that is really amazing. Uh, however, we're really afraid of uh, that regulatory sandbox being a missed opportunity if we don't amend it a little bit. Um, the draft included priority access to regulatory sandbox for SMEs and startups and reduced compliance assessment fees, uh, which are good things. Um, however, the condition for access to and use of sandboxes, I think, need to be a little bit clarified to be useful and to actually be used uh, by startups. So we believe that we should uh, clarify a little bit the eligibility process um, and the se selection criteria uh, for the application procedures. That's really important so that we don't have different regulatory sandbox according to the member states. Uh, I think it's also important to have um, a har harmonized system. Um, our startups asked us, what is the duration of the scheme? For how many years, for how many months would that last? So I think that's an important question also. Um, is there any possi possible transition period? How do we go from being an experimental uh, AI in a regulatory sandbox to a go-to-market strategy? Um, is there anything planned in there and that we could add? Uh, so, of course, the conditions of use. We are talking about uh, high-risk AI startups. So even if there is a regulatory sandbox, uh, what can we do? What can we not do? in that scope. Um, and is there any also appeal mechanism? So we, we always have uh, startups that might be disappointed by not being able to, to apply to, to a sandbox. Uh, is there anything that they can do also to, to appeal those decisions? Um, I think what we can do is to look a little bit what the fintech sector did in the UK. I think it's one of the the first country and legislations are really exploring a bit more the, the regulatory sandbox. I think there might be lessons to draw um, on these experiences. Um, and with France Digital and our AI startups, we're really open to, to, to discuss this with, uh, with the Commission. I know the Parliament has been looking uh, to improve this as well. Uh, I think it, 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 it is a consensus that the regulatory sandbox is a good tool within the text. Uh, but I think it's also a consensus that uh, it needs to be a little bit amended and, and clarified so that companies can actually benefit and get all the opportunities that come uh, from that. That's, uh, that's interesting. And thank you also for, for, for the detail there, because often these concerns are just raised at a high level. But this is very specific. Um, your your Danka, um, do you have any sort of comments on that you know was the idea always that the sandbox was going to be um this is like the first version in the in the original draft um and since it's a new concept for the eu that this was always going to evolve um and is it reasonable to expect uh, that the, the 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 very intensive uh, conversations that are happening around this issue will uh, will impact the eventual shape of this sandbox um, and I'm not sure if you were directly involved in drafting it, but also what the sort of models were, inspirations for this and how the Commission wants this to work in practice. I think that that would be interesting for our audience to uh, learn more about. 
Um, these are indeed excellent questions, um, and um, we certainly see that uh, as a tool that, uh, of course, evolves also now based on all the discussions. Um, when we proposed it, um, we relied very much on the success indeed of sandboxes like in the fintech sector, in data, energy, we have more and more. There are different um, uh, objectives of those sandboxes, and I think uh, in our case, we certainly want to use it um, as, as really the middle ground where we can achieve both excellence and support companies to innovate, to get access to the market, um, but also this uh, trust, reliability, and also su give support and advice for this uh, very challenging first stage where we all understand that companies will need a lot of advice and legal certainty, how those rules will be applied to their concrete model. So that's why we really see a lot of value and there are already discussions actually even to to consider um, the implementation of those sandboxes even during the transitional period so we can actually uh, help companies already prepare. We don't want to wait the last moment often like with the GDPR um, on the 25th of May um, that then the regulation start, but support uh, before that companies give uh, enough um, clarity on, on these very important issues that are now raised. And we'll, even if we try the best, I think many of them will uh, remain uh, in general still at an abstract level. So the legislation is future proof, but there is also uh, a lot of practical guidance, implementation, standards, Standards, how these are going to be uh, implemented. And um, now concretely for actually for the questions from Julia, I think the concern that we need more clarity on eligibility, on the terms of the conditions, uh, the expected uh, uh, timeline um, and the support, uh, the various um, um, framework, how this can be actually implemented in practice, we'll be very frank with you. We wanted uh, and we've thought about this, but we wanted to leave those rules because we uh, fully agree and that's what we have proposed. They have to be uh, um, common for the whole European Union or member states because we don't want every country to start to implement uh, uh, different conditions uh, that can create a lot of barriers for SMEs, for other participants that can distort the level playing field and then in the end we might also have uh, inconsistent application of um, an uh, understanding of what we mean and actually how we also apply the regulation. So uh, at the same time we didn't want to put that because you see it's already a regulation of uh, more than 100 pages it's so complex it requires so much discussions for um, all these uh, things so that's why our objective to, was to to keep it light in the regulation itself leave the legal basis provide there the opportunity to, to framework set the main uh, objectives and the principles but then actually uh, develop uh, common implementing rules like I don't know if you are familiar with the EU legislative acts but normally these are rules that are implementing the regulation and that will come up um, once the regulation is adopted uh, the commission will have um, a proposal it will be discussed with member states committee uh, with implementing acts responsible and certainly with those implementing rules we can change them much faster more flexible because it's also a learning process. Uh, we have to have this flexibility and um, to be able to change it because not we see how how long it takes for the regulation, better not to put those details rules there. But certainly um, uh, we are already reflecting um, and also there are ideas from countries already to consider implementing um, similar kind of projects um, and uh, we work together on these common rules and certainly involve also SMEs, um, stakeholders, um, uh, experts, um, also from other sectoral sandboxes. Uh, so, so we really um, have um, all the stakeholder input we need to, to make them uh, workable. Fantastic. Thank you, Jordanka. You, you, you raised a, a sort of paradox of lawmaking uh, should you make a law more complex in order to make it less complex uh, for certain uh, for certain actors who will be affected by it? Um, I, I, I think that's an interesting um, philosophical and practical question. Um, uh, 
I, I, I do have one more question for you. So please give me a, a hand sign if you are about to hop off. But I wanted to actually move on to Sylvia um, uh, for, for now. Um, because uh, your, your Danko already raised this um, issue of the actual implementation of legislation in the EU sort of uh, uh, legal framework. Um, and that's, a, that's an interesting um, angle for, for uh, you know, a, a large technology company like Google. Uh, there's currently a raft of, of digital laws coming out of Brussels. This is a very, um, very hectic year, actually, in terms of, of these laws being passed. Um, so I wondered if you could give us a sense of how this changes the compliance and regulatory work for a business like Google um, and how, 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 how you begin to see these laws um, interact with each other uh, and whether you're concerned around any uh, overlaps or contradictions. Basically, just walk us through how you adapt to these changing, um, pretty fast changing compliance uh, realities, bearing in mind that the laws aren't necessarily in force yet, but will, will quickly uh, become live. Yes, that, that's a big uh, question. I will try to stick actually to uh, AI regulation and AI Act and, and that sphere, but of course, like indeed a, a big wave of, of regulation um, coming. Um, when it comes to uh, AI Act, I think uh, from Google perspective, I can kind of share with you um, that there is a big focus uh, at Google, but also I know that, that the wider industry on kind of compliance readiness. Uh, and when it comes to um, AI Act, I think, um, uh, um, you know, regulation is kind of novel uh, globally, but from the perspective where it comes from, um, at, uh, Google and many other companies, they had already their AI principles, so kind of self-regulatory instruments well ahead. The discussion about regulation actually started in Brussels with the white paper and even before. We have contributed to the high-level expert group that started with the previous commission mandates. There were guidelines. Developed so as a company already since 2017, we have developed our um, AI principles. If you look at those principles, they are very much aligned in terms of um, legal requirements uh, for high-risk AI applications and the Commission's proposal. That's of course, um, you know, the, the, those are the objectives. Those are the principles. Now we are talking about legislation, um, but uh, from from Google's perspective. Um, those principles are not only kind of, you know, uh, empty words. We actually kind of have processes within the company that operationalize those principles. So whenever we kind of uh, deploy and develop a new AI model or new solution into our products, we are actually taking, looking at those principles and we have designed over those years um, certain processes. And I think um, uh, we will be able definitely to build on that kind of uh, body of expertise and internal procedures to already think about the compliance and that thinking has already started now, even though the, the co-regulators are, are thinking about this um, and kind of discussing and, and a lot of things are uh, still very much unclear. So I'm, on that point, I'm actually quite positive. Uh, to, to the second part maybe of your question in terms of uh, already kind of your done cut, spoke to this about GDPR, of course, AI Act interacts with other pieces of legislation that are already there. GDPR, market surveillance, regulation, uh, even medical devices, of course, all those sectorial regulations. Um, uh, in the parliament, we see some, some amendments that kind of potentially conflict with DSA or even political ads regulation. And of course, there is um, more regulation to come in that space with liability um, rules that I think commission is kind of thinking about uh, as a next uh, phase of this kind of looking at ex post what happens and if the damages are, are happening. So maybe on that last point from, from our perspective, this is um, uh, maybe kind of a bit of a challenge to already kind of while the AI Act is, is still being discussed and it addresses many of the questions around how you can make sure that those AI systems brought to Europe are less opaque, that are more transparent, more fair, more explainable. Um, at the same time, we're thinking about new legislation that would actually come with the same sort of uh, thinking that, you know, th because those systems are th like that, even though the AI Act would help to make them more transparent, more accountable, um, more secure, uh, we are already thinking about uh, um, additional legislation with, uh, with such concepts as, as, for instance, strict liability for, for AI providers. So from that perspective, probably a bit of nervousness <laughs> on our side, but at the same time, uh, of course, uh, you know, like with every piece of uh, legislation, we are thinking about compliance uh, well ahead. So those two perspectives of how we think about this internally and how those different pieces and growing body of regulation is kind of um, uh, interacting with each other. 
across different um, modalities. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. Uh, your, your Danke, I hope I can ask this before you have to dash off. You have very valiantly held uh, your, your phone up in the air. I hope your arm is okay. Um, and uh, the last one for you, uh, and feel free also after addressing this to, to, to conclude uh, with, with, with your final observations, but uh, on something relatively specific. The last meeting of the T Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council um, saw the EU and the US committing to avoiding unnecessary trade barriers caused by regulation uh, and maximizing common approaches. Now, the US and the EU are, are uh, ha have different sort of legal philosophies, and I think where the US is more going down the line of self-regulation uh, and voluntary standards, uh, the, the EU's uh, draft is, 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 well, it's out there for we're talking about today, right? So I'm, I'm curious whether you think there's a possibility for a shared set of technical standards around trustworthiness uh, and reliability, and how you conceive of the notion of regulatory compatibility between different jurisdictions like the EU and the US that nevertheless share common values, uh, particularly in a time like this where it becomes increasingly apparent that it's important to, to stand together. Uh, what, what, what does this mean in practice um, as far as the, the, the AI Act goes? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Ben. Um, I think that's indeed a very important question because um, we have seen and we also heard from Sylvia uh, all those principles, requirements, things that they are not coming now or out of the blue or the commission. They are actually building on a lot of consensus uh, and a lot of also good practices and industry-led initiatives uh, coming from the industry, but also now um, going well beyond also the European level level going at um, OECD, uh, International, UNESCO, Council of Europe uh, Forum, and, and we are all discussing about similar principal requirements. Um, um, and also, of course, um, that we see that also as a very important uh, discussion because we are probably indeed um, one of the first uh, to, to propose mandatory regulation, but we see that uh, this consensus is emerging also um, at international level. And we've seen it also, and that is also one of the, the key area, as you mentioned, with also our bilateral partnerships, especially with, with the US, with uh, the Trade and Technology Council. Um, the work on AI is a significant component, uh, and there the work, especially on common standardization and compatibility between those um, different standards that are emerging because I think we are all dealing with a very fast developing challenging technology we can learn a lot from each other in that process bring the different perspectives uh, and certainly with the US partners especially the the NIST uh, standardization institute we have seen uh, excellent developments and we have very good cooperation um, there is even one of the key deliverables that was agreed uh, most recently uh, to be produced uh, in this Technology and Trade Council work on AI is to come up with a joint roadmap on evaluating and measuring uh, AI because that really boils down already not to just to the high level principles, but also having this common understanding when we are talking about uh, accuracy, robustness, resilience, how we actually implement them also and measure them in practice. Um, and uh, we think this is, this is really important. Um, we've seen also that I'm just coming actually also from a discussion, uh, online discussion uh, with OECD, we have seen also that there is a lot of work also there to bring those different perspectives um, also in a broader international context. Um, so um, I think that's, that's really the area which is most valuable also for European Union to, to go and to work together with the partners, but also for companies who are uh, certainly operating uh, uh, across borders and across regions um, um, so we certainly um, are working on this and, and want to deliver those compatible frameworks. Thank you for that. Another area to, to watch uh, and uh, where developments are, are, are happening uh, very dynamically. Um, I, again, Mikael is not here, uh, but Sylvia, you're a, a public policy professional. <clears throat> Maybe for the benefit of the audience, you're able to talk us through um, 
you know, what's going to happen next with the AI Act? Where are we in the sort of schedule? Um, and what are the kind of timelines we're looking at, as well as the actual formal procedural steps that await uh, going forward? Happy to take this one, but your Danka, please compliment. You are kind of much closer on the regulatory side. So I, I think uh, um, well, we had a bit of that uh, that outline, but uh, I'm understanding that the, the French presidency is kind of mostly focusing on kind of now uh, sending the progress report on all the work that they have done that your Danka told us about. But of course, that the council is um, somewhat uh, uh, not close to the general purpose, so the kind of final position. Um, and then, of course, the work in the parliament is ongoing, multiple uh, committees involved, a very complex procedure. Um, we have uh, the two leading committees on the file, uh, internal market committee and, and kind of uh, civil liberties privacy committee involved in ProLibe. I think they are kind of now in the phase of, of um, issuing amendments to the commission and, and they are associated committees. Uh, as far as I understand, this work is going to continue also towards the end of the year. Um, so I think we are kind of uh, still um, up for a couple of months of those negotiations in different institutions. And I think, uh, uh, at least from my understanding, there is an expectation that probably towards um, early next year, we might uh, enter into the kind of the final phase of trilogues um, uh, to kind of iron out the remaining issues across the institutions. Thank you for that. Uh, so in, in, in a nutshell, uh, we've got Parliament working on amendments in the various committees that have been assigned on this, uh, and that's going to continue uh, for, for, for another few months. Uh, in parallel, the Council of Ministers is, is working on compromises. And then once the Commission, Parliament uh, and uh, the, the member states have, have arrived at the final positions, there comes the big effort to, to craft the uh, the eventual text, uh, and so this is this process is going to last, um, you know, for 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 at least um, at least till the end of the year, if if not longer. Um, okay, uh, and then um, we are we are getting towards the end of this. Um, I uh, want uh, both of you to have an opportunity to conclude with your final thoughts. Uh, Julia did um, also just wonder, you know, what 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 do we, what does the French uh, startup sector think are like the biggest barriers to growth and success in Europe uh, that you would like um, uh, that you would like to be reformed but feel free to just um, also conclude with your uh, general uh, observations around the AI Act. No that's an interesting question actually when you ask AI startups what is the main barrier to growth for you 63 percent of them will respond human resources, talent, tech skills. Uh, we have a huge uh, skills gap in, uh, in the tech sector and these companies really, really struggle to, to recruit. Uh, and, and that's, you know, at, at the very big level, it's very problematic. So I think in, in that sense, we should also think of, you know, when we analyze the, the, the burdens of the, the AI Act for, uh, high-risk AI startups, we must also think of how many people would they have to recruit in order to comply with the new law? And would they be able to recruit these people? Are they available on the market? And how expensive are they? Because we have also inflation on, on, on salaries at the moment uh, for, for these very qualified people. So that's a very interesting perspective also to have. And I would like just to conclude on another note that wasn't highlighted here. Uh, is the fact that the AI Act is only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we fully realize that standardization and normalization is the next big thing. Uh, and major negotiations are happening now as we, as we speak in normalization committees. Uh, from a very pragmatic perspective, what will happen at some point is that an AI startup CEO will tell his CTO, its CTOs and engineers this is the norm, the standard that you must comply on. You have to comply with that standard, that standard, and that standard so that my company is compliant with the law. And now it's where the big game is going to start, is the negotiations of these norms. And we must 
as also European actors, we must ensure that we participate to the discussion, that we have a, a place at the table. And what is really interesting is that at the French level, French government realized that, and um, we have actually we're actually participating in a program now with um, the French Normalization Committee and with the uh, the promotion of the. Um, a secretariat for investment here uh, attached to the prime minister in France. We are participating in a program where startups actually now are being included in this standardization and normalization committees for the first time, because in the past we were never really associated to these discussions. And if we want to make sure that tomorrow's standards and norms will reflect the European values, and the European just technological environment, we must participate to these discussions and help elaborate these future norms for AI. So that's where the, the second game will be happening. And we are happy uh, that you know the, the French government helped us having our spot at the table. Uh, and we encourage also all member states and all SMEs organizations across Europe um, to, to go and participate also in these discussions because it's, it, it's the next big thing. Thank you very much. A, a, a very salient point to raise. Uh, you're quite right that uh, in the background, this uh, debate around uh, setting standards and norms, uh, industrial standards is, is, is going on. And it's important that everyone in the ecosystem participates. Great to hear also that your organization is so actively involved in this. Um, so, so thank you for, for raising that, not to be underestimated, the role that standards will play going forward, both in this law and more generally um, as this technology is rolled out. Um, Sylvia, the last word um, goes to you. Any final thoughts? Yeah, it has been a very fascinating discussion, um, but we're left with uh, limited speakers and we are at time. So I'm just going to be um, maybe using a, a quote, a sling, a quote from, from our CEO who actually said that, you know, AI is too important and not, uh, not to regulate and actually the biggest risk um, would come from not uh, adopting it and not using it. So I think when we talk about regulation, it's important to kind of make sure that there is a right framework, but actually the important thing is to make sure that uh, AI use is, is used across the board uh, by different organizations, not only companies like Google, but also the French startups and all the startups and all different organizations because the potential is huge. So a different part of the de debate, but I wanted to end on that positive note as well. Wonderful. Well, that brings us to the end of today's panel. Thank you uh, for, for sticking with us through some technical difficulties, but I think we got there in the end and had a very fruitful conversation. Thank you to uh, Sylvia and Julia, uh, and um, I wish you all uh, the very best. Um, take care, everyone, and until the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you.